and uh, we'll get started writing the scripture this morning. You pray for us. I got some good news for you, real good news. Um, I got to lead a young man to the Lord this morning on the way to church on the telephone. A uh, young man called me. He may be watching right now, but he's been uh, watching us on YouTube for quite some time. He is in Houston, Texas, 17 years old. He called twice last night. My cell phone won't work at my house. And uh, I uh, called this morning, and I called him back, and uh, he said, I want to get saved. And he'd been watching videos on YouTube. I got to lead him to the Lord this morning, y'all. Hallelujah. On the way to church. And that, that's a good way to start Sunday off, isn't it? Hey, man, that's great. That's great. Only 17 years old. Uh, lives with his mom and sister. Pray for them. They are in Houston, Texas. And I've done sent him to Shady Acres out there, Baptist Church, uh, where the Danny Farley's pastor. And I said, you get in there, buddy. They'll, they'll help you. So y'all pray for that young man. That's good news. Um, about my walking, I, I've not uh, been able, I couldn't hardly walk Tuesday when that, uh, when that guy fell on me the other night. And so y'all pray for a miracle, okay? Need a miracle on this. Doing better, actually. Uh, I hadn't run since Tuesday night, and that's the longest I did, hadn't run in 10 years. And I, got, I can feel it right here already. Uh, uh, you won't be able to tell me from Jimmy by next Sunday, except he's got a beard. Uh, if I don't get there, so I'm just kidding. But anyway, let's open our Bibles to, uh, uh, I said Mark 16, I mean Matthew 16, Matthew 16, and I'm going to read some scripture this morning and bring you a message I don't usually do on Sunday morning like this, but I feel like it's what the Lord put on my heart, Matthew 16 and verse 16. This is familiar scripture, and I'd like for us to just nail a few things down here this morning that I think would be a help to us. Matthew 16, 16. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. That's the only way you can know this is true is for God to let you see it. That's the only way. It has, it's a work of God. And, um, and he said, I say also unto thee, verse 18, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, speaking of himself, I will build my church. Them two words right there split the difference in the Catholic church and the Baptist church for thousands of years. Who's the church built on? The Catholic church teaches the church is built upon Peter because Jesus said, you're a rock, and I'm gonna build my church on you, and Peter was the first pope and all that. It's not what he said. He said, you're Peter, and on this rock, your confession of faith that I'm the Son of God, I will build my church. What he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Little words there in the middle of verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. I want to preach this morning on that, them two words, my church. What did Jesus mean when he said, my church? Here, the Lord Jesus Christ gives a divine plan for the future church that he was going to build. Now, he said, my church, it belonged to him. When we say, a lot of times I've heard people criticize preachers. They say, come to my church, and they say, oh, he owns it. When we say come to my church, we don't mean we own it. We don't own the building or the, or the place. We just mean that's the one where we go to, that, that's the sense in which we say it. Sometimes a preacher will say, my church, and the people say, oh, he thinks, you know, he don't own it or anything like that. It's like saying, uh, it's like some of you people come, uh, when you say, um, uh, come over and see me this week, he came to my work, uh, you know, which that's not bad English. That's bad English anyway. You mean where you work, come to the place where you work. I think that's what you mean. Uh, but you say, he came to my work, People talk, try to talk all cool and everything, don't even speak right English anymore. It's like somebody said the other day, I said, where are y'all going to eat? And they said, we're going to do McDonald's. I said, you mean you're going to eat at McDonald's? Is that what you mean? Or are you trying to sound cool? Uh, uh, it's hard to get people to talk straight. Uh, but anyway, he said, I will build my church. So when, he, when we say my church, that's, we don't mean like we own it. It means like my school or where, where I go to school. 
When we say my church, I'm not about where I go to church, where I meet with the church. But when he says my church, it's ownership. He owns it. So he's given the future uh, exhortation uh, uh, or example and explanation of what the church, which is his body, would be. Now, there was no church which is his body until it's formed in the New Testament. Uh, somebody will write me an email about that statement, and they'll say, oh, no, Acts said there was a church in the wilderness. There was a called-out assembly. The word church means called out. That's what ecclesia means. Ecclesia means a called-out group. So in that sense, there was a church in the Old Testament wilderness as a called out group. But there was no church which is his body until his body was formed. He didn't have a body in the Old Testament. Uh, he didn't have a body until he came here and was born in Bethlehem's manger. Those disciples, when he breathed on them and said, a lot, of, a lot of preachers disagree on that. When he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Ghost, they believed the church started right there. Now, he might have got in them right there, but they didn't get in him. His body was standing there looking at them. His body wasn't formed until Acts chapter 2. They didn't get in that body, baptized into the body of Christ officially till Acts chapter 2. I'll get them on that too, uh, but it's right. Now, now, you watch. The church this morning, by introduction this morning, is in the age of grace. The church and the kingdom of God are two different things. One reason why there's so many crazy preachers on TV is they can't differentiate between the church and the kingdom. The kingdom of the Lord God is going to come future, and if you get that confused with the church, you think we're reigning now and we're in the millennial reign. And that's caused all kinds of wars. That's caused all kinds of conflict. That's caused families to uh, go different directions in the religious belief. They confuse church with kingdom. The kingdom of the Lord is a completely different thing than his dealings with the church. Uh, we, can take, we can show you that. It's all through the Bible. The church which is his body and Israel are not the same. Israel's dealings with, God's dealing with Israel as a nation and God's dealing with the church. In the Old Testament, the, the wife of Jehovah God was Israel. And you know they had a lot of problems. And, but the wife of the Lord Jesus is the church. So the, Jesus marries the church. John the Baptist was the friend of the bridegroom. He's like the best man at the wedding. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. The church is not Israel. When they replace Israel with the church, that's called British Israelism or replacement theology. Replacement theology means you take all them promises of God in the Old Testament and put them on the church in the New Testament. And that's all over the internet. People all over the country are going crazy over that doctrine. And that's why you hear them saying, we're reigning now. Satan's under our feet. I don't, you know, whatever. You, Satan ain't under your feet, buddy. I, I know I heard a guy say one time, uh, he said, Satan's bound. We're ruling with Christ. Christ right now. And the old preacher jumped up and said, if the devil's bound now, he sure do have a long chain. I go, brother, he's at my house last night, wasn't he? And wasn't he over at your house yesterday? He ain't bound now. No, 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 no. The devil is as a roaring lion now, seeking whom he may devour. Now the day's going to come when he will be bound. And the Lord going to put him on the chain gang for a thousand years while we're on our honeymoon with our husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, brother, they'll throw him in the lake of fire forever. So the church in Israel are not the same. The church in the Old Testament was a mystery hidden. The Old Testament prophets saw over top of it. When an Old Testament prophet saw, he saw the sufferings of Christ there in Isaiah 53, and then right over top of the church in the millennium and in eternity. So it was hidden and given to the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 5 through 9. The Old Testament prophets saw over top of the church. The church is the theme of the Pauline epistles. That means Paul, the apostle of the Gentiles, wrote the epistles to the church. So when he said, my church, when he said, my church, this is who he's talking about. He's talking about born again, body of believers in Christ in the New Testament age of grace. 
I am so thankful this morning that I got to be a part of his church. The church is the greatest thing in this world. The church is not an organization. The world looks at it like, you know, when they try to put taxes on churches and stuff, they don't understand. They think it's just another organization. It's not an organization. It is an organism. It's alive. It's a living thing. Like like inside, like an oyster, the pearl in there. It's not just a dead thing. The church is alive. So when he said my church, buddy, he's talking about his church. Now, we're going to apply that to shining light this morning, this local body of believers here. And I want to say three things about it. Number one, number one, what my church is. When he said my church, what is it? Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20. Let's, let's take just a second and turn over there to this. I want to show you this because uh, a lot of people are confused about this. The church is three things. Take just a minute. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2 for a second. And let me show you a verse of scripture here about what the church is. I say first of all, the church is a building. The church is a building. No, no, you don't jump ahead of me. I'm not talking about brick and mortar and sheetrock and wood and carpet, no. A lot of people say, well, there's the church. The church is not a building like this. This is not the church. There's no difference in this sheet rock and them rock and that wood as there is anywhere out there in a mall or anywhere else. The church is a building, but it's not brick and mortar. Look at Ephesians chapter two and verse 20. And you're built, he's talking about us, Christians, fellow saints, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. That's your concrete underneath it. Jesus Christ, the cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth to a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So the church is a building. It's a building. Amen? Jesus himself is the cornerstone. The apostles are the foundation, and we are fitly framed together. Ephesians, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 said, ye are God's building. We're a building. The old folks used to say, I'm working on a building, I'm working on a building, I'm working on a building for my Lord. For and people laughed at them, them crazy old people. Listen, that's scriptural. That's scriptural. That boy got saved this morning on the, uh, when I was on the way to church out there in Texas. You know what God did? God put him as a piece in the building. When I got saved up here at Nebo Baptist Church, I got my place in the building. I don't know if I'm a brick. I don't know if I'm a rock. I don't know if I'm a pipeline. I want to, I don't know what I am, but I'm in God's building this morning. Yes, sir. Well, the church is a building. But not only that, the church is a body. The church is a body. When you got saved, you got in his body. Here, let's look at since you got your Bibles open, look at the chapter before that. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head. This is Ephesians 1:22 over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him. If you got saved, you are a part of his body. That's why we can't go down. The body's on earth, the head is in heaven. Think about that. The heaven has the head. That's why we can't drown. The church ain't gonna drown. You can't drown with your head out of water. It might get deep on us, but this is as far as it can go because the head is in heaven. We are all members like him. Now, we are the Lord's body. So that means uh, the Bible said over in 1 Corinthians that some were I. Some were I, and uh, this I, uh, he said, some were an ear. You got some people in the body of Christ, they're a hand. They, you got some people in the body of Christ, they're feet. This brother right here, there's no doubt in, in my mind, he, y'all are part, maybe the feet and the hands of the Lord going all the way down there to that foreign field down yonder. We're going, the Lord has people in the Bible, in his body that can see. And in that scripture, it said uh, 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 the, the eye, the ear, the elbow, the, the hands, it all makes up the body. And that's the way we are. Everybody, we have people in here this morning that make up the body of Christ. We have those men back there uh, run, running the sound. That's the ear, you know. Uh, we, have, uh, we have me up here. That's the mouth, no doubt. <laughs> uh, 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 we have uh, people sing. And all are part of the body. And it functions, you know. The body, what if, he, and in, in 1 Corinthians he said, what if all were an eye? What if everybody was, what if all you was is a big eyeball? About this big. One big eyeball. 
and you set it there on the table, what could it do? It could see, and that's it. Couldn't go nowhere, couldn't sing a song, couldn't, it's all I. And what if you just, I know people that are all mouth, that's for sure. Uh, what if all were just a big mouth? Uh, uh, I know places that ought to be called that, Big Mouth Baptist. And that, that's a proper name for it. But you know what? Uh, what if all were a foot? You couldn't, you know. But he, the Lord's put everybody as a part of his body. Now, I don't know what part you are, uh, but you've got to find that out and, and stay busy. Don't get jealous if you're the armpit. I mean, I didn't make this thing. I, I, mean, I mean, don't get mad. We're all a part of the body. And uh, going up these things is a lot harder than going down. Uh, but I'm telling you what, brother, uh, listen to me, that we are a part of his body. We're a part of his body, hallelujah. We're a part of his body. And then the, we're a part of the bride. So the church is a building, it's a body, and it's a bride. I mean, think about that. What could be more a uh, beautiful picture than the Lord coming from heaven and everybody here being a part of his bride? Don't get jealous. I heard some one lady say, uh, she got married and said, why does it all have to be a he? God's a he. Jesus is a he. The Holy Spirit's a he. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah, but the bride is a she. The bride of Christ is a she. God's not chauvinistic. God's not against women. God's not uh, one to say, well, I don't, I don't want to be a man. Well, we're all going to be a woman. Uh, we're all the body of Christ. I don't understand how that's going to work, but I know one thing. It's going to be a great day. The bride will be in the wedding. The guest will be at the wedding. When I said that a minute ago about the difference between Israel and the church, a lot of people have a heart attack when you start talking like that. They simply do not understand right division of the scripture. You, you look up Matthew twenty two ten, 10, and it said when that wedding was come, the wedding was furnished with guests. Why does it say guests during the tribulation? Because the bride's already there. The guests come in and are saved during the tribulation. Luke chapter 12 and verse 36. Write it down and study this one when you get home. He told them guys over there, keep your lamps burning, keep your loins girded, keep all of that. And he said that and look for your Lord when he shall return from the wedding. So when he comes after these people, he's already married. The bride is already with him. So we're a body, we're a building, we're a bride. Number two. Let me tell you, number two, let's talk about this for a minute. What my church has. What my church has. When he said my church, it has. First of all, it has the right foundation. Now you take this building here. You know, a building ain't no good if it don't have a good foundation. This building would never stand this morning if somebody, I've, I've built a few, I've been involved in quite a few building programs, and you say, man, when are we going to get started on the building? And the first thing you do is start digging down in the ground. I said, I don't want to dig in a hole in the ground. I want a building. You've got to dig down. And boy, them concrete trucks in there, I used to get sick watching thousands of dollars of concrete go down in the hole, in the mud. And they said, you got to have it. you got to have it. And that concrete goes down, that's your foundation. And the church this morning has the right foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, something couldn't survive through the centuries and over the years like the church of Jesus Christ has without the right foundation. He is the foundation. Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. We're all told about that story over there where that man built his house on the rock and when the rain came, it couldn't fall. And the other guy built his house on the sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. I told that young man out in Texas this morning, I said, listen, buddy, you accept what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross as your payment for your sin. That's all you can do. That's it. There's nothing else. Everything else is sinking sand. You know, I got to thinking, uh, if I had to go, if I had to die today, and I told him this, if I had to die today, and the Lord, it don't work like this, but if it did, I said, and the Lord said, Danny, why should I let you in heaven? You know what I'd say? I wouldn't say, I, I wear a tie, I go to church every Sunday. That ain't got nothing to do with it. You know, I, I, I preach, every, that's got nothing to do with it. You know what I'd say? I am trusting what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross 2,000 years ago. And he said, that's it, come on in. That's the foundation, y'all. That's it. 
That's it. All other ground is sinking sand. Muhammad is sinking sand. Buddha is sinking sand. Jesus said, I am the way, not a way, the way, the truth, not a truth, the life. Nobody comes to the Father but my Ain't you glad this morning we got the right foundation? It'll stand, buddy. This thing will stand. Then we got the right formation. The Holy Spirit, Acts chapter two. They said, did you know uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 12? We're getting letters about this too. But every Christian is baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. There is no such thing as a saved person that don't have the Holy Spirit. They're one in three and three in one. And as the old country preacher said, you either got all three of them or you ain't got nine. And that means this. You can't separate them three. When the Lord comes in your life and heart, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all together. The Holy Spirit according to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13 baptizes you into the body of Christ. Now you gotta understand, you're filled with the Spirit many, many times. We're constantly praying, Lord, fill me, fill me over and over and over again. But you don't get the Holy Spirit later after. The Holy Spirit's what puts you into the body of Christ. We have the right formation. Number three, we have the right fellowship. We have the right fellowship. We fellowship with each other. We're a family. We're a family. When I first got saved, I, I started going to revivals everywhere and camp meetings everywhere. And them old preachers, they'd get up and they'd say, and uh, brother, uh, and uh, brother, and every other word they said was brother. And, and at, at first I thought, are, that, are they these people his brothers? I didn't, I didn't, yeah, I didn't know what he's talking about. And then, uh, and then I heard that song, uh, I'm, a, I'm glad I'm a part of the family of God. And we're all, you may notice, we say brother and sister around here. You know that song? And I thought, everybody who's saved is my sister, girls, and everybody who's saved is my brother who's a man or a boy. And I thought, we are a big family. We have the right fellowship. And then we have the right financial system. It's about tithes and offering. That's always been. God's never went up. He don't have to vote on the interest rate. He never goes up. He never goes down. You know how, you're you talking about politics a while ago. You know how you know the right political view is the right political view is the right scriptural view. And if it's scripturally right, it's politically right, it's domestically right, it's religious right, it's right on everything. And God's always said a flat rate, 10%. If you, if you make $5, it's 50 cent. If you make $50, it's, it's $5. If you make $100, it's $10. And that way everybody pays the same percentage-wise. It ain't like, well, you make more money, so you give more. You don't punish somebody because they make more money. I mean, or, or, or let somebody off the hook because it won't work. You can't do that. God's a flat rate for everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the right financial system. Now, if you get that through your head right, the, the Lord will bless you financially. But you're like that little boy. They said, uh, they said a little boy one time, he said uh, uh, he had a dollar. He had 10 dimes. And uh, he's... And he said, now, Daddy said, now, son, one of them dimes is the Lord. He said, okay. And he said, I'll give one to the Lord Sunday. And he's walking down the street, you know, and he's playing with that money and everything. He dropped one that went down in the sewer drain. He said, there went the Lord's dime. <laughs> that was the Lord's, the one he lost. Ain't that right? Now, look up here now. I'll tell you when it's time to pray. Some of you like that. First time, well, I had that bill to pay. There went the Lord's dime. Uh, you better not take it off like that. Uh, we have the right financial system, this is ridiculous. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna figure out me some way of doing this a little bit better. But anyway, we have the right financial system. And then we have the right future. We have the right future. Did you know the church has the right future? We got a future, people. Listen, years ago I sat down and I thought, how can I use my time the best? What's, I only got one life. What's the absolute best I can invest my life in? And I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I used to play music. I had a band when I first got saved. And, we played, and I thought, I could be a Christian musician. I thought, ah, anybody can do that. I thought, I could do, anybody, I want to do something that only I can do. And I got it. I got it. The best thing I can do with my life is load up everybody I can and get them on the buses and get them to church and get them to the Lord because we got a future and a half, let me tell you. Uh, nothing, nothing. The best thing could happen for us today be the Lord come. I had a man the other day. Uh, he hadn't seen this guy in a long time, 
And uh, he hadn't seen this guy in a long time. He said, how you doing, brother? He said, well, how's your wife? He said, she's in heaven. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. He thought, well, that don't sound right. Am I sorry she's in heaven? I'm wondering hell. And he said, oh, I'm glad. Well, that sounds like I'm glad she died. And he said, uh, and, and the, the, the right answer is, we're not going to stay down here. We're all leaving here one day. We got a future, hallelujah. We got a future. They said one time, Miss Christian was arguing with this atheist. And this atheist was, uh, he was uh, arguing, saying death ends it all. We talked to a, a woman down here on bus route the other day. Uh, we knocked on the door and she stuck her head out the, the screen window upstairs and said, what do you want? I said, we're here from the church. We run a bus right through here and everything. She said, we don't believe in God. I said, well, you, you, will you come to church? I bet your kids come. She said, yeah, the kids can go if you want to. I said, why don't you believe in God? She said, we don't believe in anybody we can't see. And I didn't want to get into a big argument, you know, standing out in the yard and it was 25 degrees that day. And, and, uh, uh, and I said, well, listen, I'm going to leave you one of these. And I left them some literature and prayed. And I thought, you know what? You know what? It's, an atheist said one time, he said, I believe that death ends it all. And the Christian looked back at him and he said, you know what, I believe that too. Death ends all your chances for partying. Death ends all your drinking nights. Death ends all your sinning. Death ends all your projects. Death ends all your ambitions. Death ends all your friendships. Death ends all your fun. Death ends all your enjoyment. Death does end it all. But if you're a Christian... Death ends all of our tears. Death ends all of our heartaches. Death ends all of our burdens. Death ends all of our sicknesses, people. Never going to be sick again. Death ends it all. Death ends all our disappointments. Death ends all of our disagreements. Death ends all of our troubles and trials. Triumphantly, the church will rise one blessed day. Hallelujah, we got the right future. Let me say thirdly this morning, I'll be through. What my church needs. What my church needs. Now these few of these things, I'm going to give you, this is what we need in our local church, the church. The church, number one, needs inspiration. The church needs inspiration, no doubt about it. You know how we get inspired? By the Word of God. By the Word of God. I drive, I drive 100 miles to go hear real Bible preaching that inspires me. I really would. And I've seen people do it. We got people that drive an hour here one way every Sunday. You know why? Somebody said a church alive is worth the drive. And I'm, I've had people tell me, uh, we got people here today uh, that, that do drive a long distance. Well, they say, you know what? I want to hear, I'd rather drive 50 miles and get filled than drive five miles and get fooled. Churches are changing today big time. It's all a show. It's all entertainment. It's taken over this country. It's sad. It's pitiful. We, for, we just figured the old way didn't work no more, so we get a rock and roll show and, and smoke coming up out of the altar and, and everybody being cool and trying to make God hip so the soccer mom generation will like it and God said, you just keep preaching that book and that book will get the job done. It'll get the job done. There ain't nothing wrong with that book right there. There ain't nothing wrong with preaching it. And I mean preaching it. Amen. I wouldn't go to a church where you didn't hear a good sermon on hell once in a while. They're not preaching the Bible. You don't identify a crook by what he preaches. Don't ever forget this. You don't identify a crook by what he preaches. You identify him by what he won't preach. What he leaves out. Anybody can have a slick tongue talk about inspiration. It's from the book. It's uh, the sing. We are inspired by the singing. Now the Bible said we're supposed to have singing in our hearts of the Lord. Do you know the, the New Testament don't even mention musical instruments? Now they're not wrong. Don't get me wrong. We're, uh, Church of Christ believes that because it's not in the New Testament. But uh, it's not against them. But it just said singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That means a real group of Christians can get together, don't have a piano, a guitar, and just start singing, Brethren, we have met to worship. Start harmonizing in there, and God get in there, and it'd be just as good as any anything. Listen, if you have to have a lot of electricity and a lot of lights and a lot of synthesizers and everything else to make your worship, something wrong with your worship, buddy. 
Amen. You can have church at home. One of the best services I've ever been in my life was at my house one night. Y'all remember that? Lord have mercy, that's office. I mean, we had people down in the floor praying, crying, people out in the yard shouting, running around, hollering, and it just started as a, as a birthday party. And, uh, and it, it got better and better and better and better and better. Hallelujah, man, we had the office time ever was. That's the right inspiration. What do you think you're doing on a mission field? They don't have no lights and PA systems and, and, and big sound system like we've got. And they still got the right worship. I'll tell you something else the church needs is elimination. We need to eliminate some things. Where do you get that? Hebrews chapter 11, 12. Lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. I, somebody wrote, wrote it, me an email the other day. I mean, our video, that one that guy made on They Sold Their Soul for Hip Hop has been viewed by almost 400,000 people now. And I'm telling you, that, that, it's, it's unbelievable. I don't even know how to put nothing on the internet. And, and they write stuff in there, and one lady said, well, it's all about grace. All about, you shouldn't talk about sin. You shouldn't talk. I don't know where she's been going to church or what Bible she's reading. or what. Listen, people. Listen, people. According to the book, let's lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Amen? That means there should be a difference in the way a Christian lives and the way this lost world lives. There's some things we should lay aside. Once you say that, you preach against any sin. Oh, he's a legalist. Oh, he's, he's judgmental. Oh, you can't preach the Bible without preaching against sin, people. It's impossible. It's impossible. I, uh, I mean, listen, there's some things. If you're going to run a race, you don't go out there with a, with a, with a couch on your shoulders and, and the TV in one hand, you know, and a refrigerator. I mean, you lay it aside. You lay it aside. There's some things you can lay aside that will help you run. The, I say something about music. I do a lot of stuff about music because I believe that music is one of the strongest influences on our kids of anything. It starts them out when they're little. You know, Nickelodeon is owned by MTV, and they start them out when they're little. Learn how to twist, learn how to dance, uh, and they're just grooming them kids up for the nightclubs. And when they get a little bit bigger, that's where they want to go. Uh, you call me crazy, however you want, or whatever you want to say, but there is no way, there is no way. I'm talking about bad music. There is no way you can listen to dirty music. I didn't say lyrics. Did you hear me? I did not say lyrics. I said dirty music. You know what dirty music is. Don't get quiet on You know what dirty music is. It can say Jesus all the way through it, but if a music's dirty, it still ain't right. And I have never known one person since I've been saved who listened to dirty music that ever won a soul while they was doing it. Never, not one. I've never known one person that would win somebody the Lord as a habit listening to dirty music. Never. I've never seen one person who listens to dirty music, read the Bible faithfully, or say amen, or sit on the front row, or get involved in that work of God. I've never seen them read the Bible faithfully or, or do anything. I've never knew a young girl yet. I've pastored a thousand. I've never knew one yet that listened to dirty music that kept her purity. Never have. Never have. Say whatever you want to. When you've done that 40 years and watched it, come back and tell me I'm wrong. We need elimination. Lay aside every way. You got that dirty junk at home, what, that pornography on your phone, those dirty pictures. Get rid of it. Eliminate it. Eliminate it. It can't help you. It can't help you. There's no way that can be good for you. It don't help your marriage. It'll destroy your marriage. Elimination. The more you live right and serve God, the more he'll have. And you say, well, Brother Danny, nobody's perfect. I know that. But, buddy, we're supposed to try our best and eliminate everything we can that ain't right in our lives. God will bless you for that. You see, some Christians are like wheelbarrows. You've got to push them all the time. Some are like canoes. They need to be paddled. Some are like kites. You have to keep a string on them or they'll fly away. Some are like footballs. You can't tell which way they'll bounce next. Amen. Lord, one day you see them, they're M&M, next day they're preaching. That's a football Christian. I don't like a ball that won't even bounce straight. I talked about that last Sunday night when we had the glory bowl. 
Some of you need to get the tape probably. Some are like balloons, full of air, ready to blow up. Some are like trailers, you have to pull them and they ain't going nowhere. But some, thank God, are like a good watch. Open face, solid goal, busy, full of good works, and on time. You know, I read about old Uncle Bud Robinson. He's an old Nazarene preacher, back when the Nazarene preachers really was right. No Bud Robinson. He was a great old preacher, couldn't talk plain, and they took him... One time they took him somewhere and took him to New York and showed him all over New York City. And if you've never seen New York, I mean, it's something to see, man. I ain't kidding you. I've been all over it several times. And uh, the first time, you, first time I went to New York, I mean, it was in Manhattan, and they said there's 75,000 people per square mile live here. And, you know, I, I'm from Nebo, and I stood there and I thought, this ain't going to work. <laughs> you can't put, and it ain't. It ain't. It, it, that was never even intended. God never even intended for people to have to live like that. Check your Bible. It's always not cities, farms, and country is the way God intended for us to live. He didn't want anybody in a big old pile. Check the Tower of Babel there in Genesis 11. And I remember looking and I said, something terrible is going to happen here one of these days. And it did. And more is coming. And they took Bud Robinson over there and they showed him New York, uh, the, the Statue of Liberty, an Empire State Building, and all that stuff. And you know what he did? Listen, Christians, that old boy went back to his motel that night and got down and prayed, and he said, Lord, I sure do thank you that I got to see all the sights of New York today. Thank you, Lord. And Lord, even more important, I want to thank you. I didn't see one thing that I wanted. Amen. Lay down and went to sleep. That's a rich man there, buddy. I'll talk more about that tonight. That's a rich man. That's a rich man. When you, oh, I'd love to be there. I'd love to be there. I can see the ball drop. The, well, whatever. I mean, it takes all kinds to make a world. But you've got a lot of growing up to do, friend. You're going to learn some stuff the hard way. This world is not our home, and it will not satisfy you. It'll bite you. It'll bite you. Take it from me. It'll bite you. It's not your friend. We need some elimination. And we need some determination to just keep going. Get serious about it. You know what we need? People get serious about church. Not just let the least little old thing. I, uh, some lady from not, not even around here, so you, don't, you don't know who I'm talking about, way off, and text me about the youth rally or something, and I said, please, y'all come to the youth rally. You know what she told me? She said, I'd love to. But she said, I can't miss my bus route. And you know what I said? I said, I ain't arguing with that. She said, I'd love to come up there that weekend, but I cannot miss my bus route. I guarantee you one thing, God's going to bless that bus route. And we had him come in here this morning. Man, did you get your shoes cleaned up? I said, boy, there he looks all right from the feet up. His shoes was orange this morning from the mud. And this is brand new carpet, buddy. I'm going to look. Uh, okay, you're all right. But he was back there wiping them off. Listen, that's holy mud, buddy. You know, most Christians wouldn't do that. They got dragging out a bunch of little kids and they had 29 on that bus. I'm going to tell you something, people. When the Lord's up there in heaven, he looks at that like, I know people say, I'm not picking up anybody. It's raining. They're getting mud in my car. Maybe we ought to pray the Lord give you an old sorry beat up car. That you're not, it's not too good to put somebody in. Well, we had six or seven hours this morning, didn't we? Seven and I'm talking about people. Listen, this ain't going to matter one of these days. What's going to matter is what we've done for the Lord. We need some determination. By the grace of God, I want to be determined to stick in here and see this thing all the way to the end. Because Jesus said, that's my church. And the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Let's stand by our heads for prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Come and get us a song this morning. I wonder today...